Chapter 55 Lacuna, Part the First Aragon noticed several things at once. First, that they were standing at one side of a circular chamber over two hundred feet across, with a large pit in the center, from which radiated a dull orange glow. Second, that the air was stiflingly hot. Third, that around the outer part of the room were two concentric rings of bench-like tiers, the back one higher than the front, upon which rested numerous dark objects. Fourth, that the wall behind this tier sparkled in numerous places, as if decorated with colored crystal. But he had no opportunity to examine either the wall or the dark objects, for in the open area next to the glowing pit there stood a man with the head of a dragon. The man was made of metal, and he gleamed like polished steel. He wore no clothes other than a segmented loincloth fashioned out of the same lustrous material as his body, and his chest and limbs rippled with muscles like those of a coal. In his left hand, he held a metal shield, and in his right, an iridescent sword that Aragon recognized as the blade of a rider. Behind the man, set within the far side of the room, Aragon vaguely saw a throne with the outline of the creature's body worn into its back and seat. The dragon-headed man strode forward. His skin and joints moved as smoothly as flesh, but every step sounded as if a great weight were being dropped on the floor. He stopped thirty feet from Aragon and Sephira and stared at them with eyes that flickered like a pair of crimson flames. Then, lifting his scaled head, he uttered a peculiar metallic roar that echoed until it seemed as if a dozen creatures were bellowing at them. Even as Aragon was wondering whether they were supposed to fight the creature, he felt a strange, vast mind touch his. The consciousness was unlike any he had encountered before, and it seemed to contain a host of shouting voices, a great, disjointed chorus that reminded him of the wind inside a storm. Before he could react, the mind stabbed through his defenses and seized control of his thoughts. For all the time he had spent practicing with Glader, Arya, and Sephira, he could not stop the attack. He could not even slow it. He might as well have tried to hold back the tide with his bare hands. A blur of light and a roar of incoherent noise surrounded him as the yammering chorus forced itself into every nook and cranny of his being. Then it felt as if the invader tore his mind into a half-dozen pieces, each of which remained aware of the others, but none of which was free to do as it wished. And his vision fragmented, as if he were seeing the chamber through the facets of a jewel. Six different memories began to race through his fractured consciousness. He had not chosen to recall them. They simply appeared, and they flew past faster than he could follow. At the same time, his body bent and flexed in various poses, and then his arm lifted Brisinger to where his eyes could see, and he beheld six identical versions of the sword. The invader even had him cast a spell, the purpose of which he did not and could not understand, for the only thoughts he had were those the other allowed. Nor did he feel any emotion but that of fading alarm. For what seemed like hours, the alien mind examined every one of his memories— from the moment he had set out from his family's farm to hunt deer in the spine, three days before he had found Sephira's egg, up until the present. In the back of his mind, Aragon could sense the same thing happening to Sephira, but the knowledge meant nothing to him. At last, long after he would have given up hope of release, if he still had command of his thoughts, the whirling chorus carefully rejoined the pieces of his mind and then withdrew. Aragon staggered forward and dropped onto one knee before he was able to regain his balance. Beside him, Sephira lurched and snapped at the air. How? he thought. Who? To capture both of them at once, and Glader as well, he assumed, was something he did not believe even Galvatorix was capable of. Again the consciousness pressed against Aragon's mind, but this time it did not attack. This time it said, Our apologies, Sephira. Our apologies, Aragon. But we had to be certain of your intentions. Welcome to the Vault of Souls. Long have we waited for you. And welcome to you as well, cousin. We are glad that you are still alive. Take now your memories, and know that your task is at long last complete. A bolt of energy flashed between Glader and the consciousness. An instant later, Glader uttered a mental bellow that made Aragon's temples throb with pain. A surge of jumbled emotions rushed forth from the Golden Dragon, Sorrow, triumph, disbelief, regret, and, overriding them all, a sense of joyous relief so intense, Aragon found himself smiling without knowing why. And brushing against Glader's mind, he felt not just one strange mind, but a multitude, all whispering and murmuring. Who? whispered Aragon. Before them, 
The man with the head of a dragon had not shifted so much as an inch. Aragon, said Sephira. Look at the wall. Look. He looked, and he saw that the circular wall was not decorated with crystal as he had first taken it to be. Rather, dozens upon dozens of alcoves dotted the wall, and within each alcove rested a glittering orb. Some were large, some were small, but they all pulsed with a soft inner glow, like coals smoldering in a dying campfire. Aragon's heart skipped a beat as comprehension dawned upon him. He lowered his gaze to the dark objects on the tiers below. They were smooth and ovoid, and appeared to have been sculpted from stone of differing colors. As with the orbs, some were large and some were small, but regardless of their size, their shape was one he would have recognized anywhere. A hot flush crept over him, and his knees grew weak. It cannot be. He wanted to believe what he saw, but he feared that it might be an illusion created to prey upon his hopes. And yet the possibility that what he beheld was actually there took his breath away, and left him staggered and overwhelmed to such a degree that he knew not what to do or say. Saphir's reaction was much the same, if not stronger. Then the mind spoke again. You are not mistaken, hatchlings, nor do your eyes deceive you. We are the secret hope of our race. Here lie our heart of hearts, the last free Eldunari in the land, and here lie the eggs that we have guarded for over a century.'